Good morning, good morning, good morning. All you prayer warriors out there, it's Sunday morning. Hope y'all are getting ready for church. Wherever you are, in Alaska, you probably just, it ain't anywhere near time to get up. <laughs> God bless you. That is, let me see, let me turn it off. Good morning, everybody. Glad to see y'all this morning. If you have your communion stuff, go ahead and get together. Peggy, Linda, Pam, Amy Ryan's watching. I think it's Charles Williams. Oh, Charlotte, there you go. Sorry, Linda. I don't know how to say your last name, Julie Langston. Good morning. Dennis Seifert is watching. Jennifer Kaiser, good morning, all you people. God bless you. Good to see you. Get your communion stuff together if you haven't. We're going to go ahead and do that first. Get our hearts all clear so we can have confidence in our prayers this morning. 1 Corinthians 11, Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken, torn open for, for you. And so we want to take that communion and remember his body. Thank you, Jesus, for being willing to sacrifice your body, willing to take the grief and the shame and the darkness of the world on your shoulders in the Garden of Gethsemane and carry it to the cross. It was a heavy, heavy weight. And then you endured such beating and such bleeding for our, for our healing, our deliverance, and our salvation. We thank you for your body that was torn for us. We receive our healing today. Jesus bought it for you. It was very expensive. So receive it. Receive what he has for you by faith right now. Receive the healing that he purchased for you. He said, this cup is the cup of the New Testament in my blood, the new covenant. He reestablished the old covenant and then brought in the new. So we thank you by your own blood, not by the blood of a lamb, but by your blood, the perfect lamb of God, when you brought in the new covenant for us. And we thank you that your blood is more powerful than any lamb that was ever slain. That was only temporary covering sin, but now our sins are covered permanently past, present, and future, and it continually washes over us, as we, and we continually repent so that our conscience is clear and our relationship is good with you. So we just ask for forgiveness today before we even start to pray for any areas of our lives that we did not obey you and that we didn't believe you, and because of our unbelief, we rebelled and disobeyed. Lord, forgive us in those areas, and as representatives of our families and our homes, and as America, we ask for forgiveness for all those in our families, in our churches, in our, in our nation. Forgive us as a, as a people where we've not listened to you or obeyed you and rebelled. And we ask that you show mercy to us. <clears throat> mercy and grace. Go ahead and take it. Thank you for your blood. <clears throat> the blood of Jesus. I need some water and they didn't bring it. <clears throat> the blood of Jesus is more powerful than anything, uh, any weapon in the devil's arsenal. The blood of Jesus is un unstoppable. And uh, <clears throat> Satan hates when you have confidence in what the covenant that Jesus made. He hates it when you talk about the name and the blood of Jesus. The name of Jesus represents the word means Yeshua, Savior, just like the word Joshua. It means Savior. So Jesus came to save the world from their sins. Didn't come to condemn the world. The world was already condemned. We don't have to condemn it. It's condemned. It's uh, without Jesus. But with Jesus, he came to save the world from their sins because he is the Savior. So the very word Jesus means Savior. And salvation comes from him. And so uh, Satan hates that word and he hates the blood and he hates the blood covenant because he knows how powerful it is. 
He likes to imitate it by doing things similar to it. He understands the power of covenant. So today when we, <clears throat> we pray, we pray with confidence because of what Jesus did and because of our connection with what Jesus did. I want to talk to you today a little bit about confidence and prayer. In 1 John, working backwards from 1 John 5, we're going to work backwards. This is the confidence in 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have already what we ask of him. First of all, I'm going to work backwards here and say why we have confidence. But first of all, when we have confidence and we know he hears us because God he said, my sheep hear my voice and we hear and he hears us. He listens to our prayers because we are in right relationship and because of the covenant of Jesus Christ. We, uh, Jesus the Christ. So we know he hears us, and we know that when we ask according to his will, that we have already, the word there is have it, what we're asking for. So when we pray in confidence, we're not praying, for, we're praying from a place of <clears throat> believing that what we're asking is God's will, confident that we already have it before it actually shows up in this visual, in the, in the world here, in this reality here. It's a reality in heaven. So we're bringing down the reality of heaven into the reality of earth. So it's your kingdom come, your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. So we're, we're pulling in heaven's realities on earth. So, but we have a confidence that we have it already, that it's ours. So you have an inheritance with Jesus Christ. Your covenant, the new covenant's better than the old covenant. In the old covenant, they had def confidence that God would provide for them, protect them, and heal them, that healing came from him. So we have a better covenant today and more authority through the blood of Jesus. So we should have more confidence. Some of the things that can steal our confidence, though, 1 John chapter 3, verse 21, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and we receive from him anything we ask because <clears throat> we obey his commands and do what pleases him. So confidence comes from being obedient to God and obeying his commands and not being in disobedience or in rebellion. It says uh, our hearts do not condemn us. You know, the scripture right before that says, this is how we know we belong to the truth. We set our hearts at rest in his presence. And if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. Sometimes our hearts falsely condemn us. <clears throat> Satan is the accusing voice. Romans 8, 1 says there's no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We are, uh, the, the accuser's voice is the one of Satan. He wants to accuse you before the Father, just like he did Job. But uh, God says that he's not the accusing voice. He's already... He's already said that we are forgiven, we are accepted by the blood of Jesus. So the, when we sin, 1 John 1, 9, we're still in 1 John here. When we sin, it says we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Uh, the verse before that, verse 7 if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, continually, like a waterfall, purifies us from all sin. And then it says, if we claim to be without sin, then we don't, we're not, there's not truth in us, but if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So he's saying that we, we do still sin but because of our, our fellowship and our connection with the blood of Jesus, we're continually being purified from our sins. And repentance is, is helping us keep a clear conscience and a right relationship with God. So James talks about uh, a few of the obstacles. And one of them is that uh, we're not living in agreement with what we say talks about the mouth a lot in James, that our mouth needs to be tamed so that we don't be saying things that are opposite spirit of Christ. 
and, not, and that we should be living out what our faith declares we're saying about our faith. So our, our actions need to match our words. God uh, always speaks and it happens because God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. So when Jesus speaks, he's always the truth and, what, and when he says something, it's gonna happen. So he can't even joke around and say something silly because it would just happen. So we, we uh, if he jokes, it's, it's, he can't say something. It'll, it'll just come into existence by the very speaking of his word because he is the word. He's the living word. So we see him called the word in, in 1 John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and we see him in Revelation being the word, coming back on that white horse with fire in his eyes, a sword in his hand, a sword, sword coming out of his mouth. And guess who's riding with him? We are. He's got a white horse. We got a white horse. We got some horses too. We're riding with him and we're going to come and that's when he does make judgment on this world and straightens everything out for good. But my, my theme here is confidence. This is the confidence we have in him. We ask anything according to his will and then it talks about our conscience not bothering us because we're, being, you know, we're walking in obedience. That's a very important. And that our mouth be in agreement with that, that we don't speak things that are disagreeing with the word of God and the truth. So James tells us, get that under control. Get your mouth saddled up, get it reined in. It talks about a ship being uh, controlled by a little bitty rudder, controls a giant ship. The tongue is the rudder, and we gotta keep it under control. So we wanna have confidence, and we, want, we don't wanna be speaking against what we're praying or what we're saying or against the attitude of Christ, right? So Hebrews talks about confidence too. Let's see. It talks about, you know, entering into rest, which is what we want. When we're praying, it's a, even though we're, you might consider it like work, it's really a, a rest in God's truth. Praying is, is work in the fact that you still have to pray and, and you continue to pray and believe. But in, the, in another way, it's rest in God's truth. So he talks about, in James, uh, Hebrews, I mean, the fourth chapter, entering into the rest of God, which is resting from working hard to try to be accepted and loved by God. You're already accepted and loved by God. You don't have to work to prove it. You don't have to do good enough to be accepted. So we work from a place of acceptance. We are continually working out our salvation, but it's not a work to, of saying, I'm, am I good enough today? Because I, did I pray long enough? Did I, uh, did I not sin today? It's more of working out what God has already worked in, working out what he worked in. So from that place, it's a place of rest because we're not trying to be approved by God. Jesus has caused us to be approved by his blood. So in that place of confidence, we, uh, for, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, starting with the 14th verse. Therefore, we have a great high priest who's gone through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. God sympathizes. Jesus knows your weaknesses. He was walking in human flesh. Though he did not sin, he felt being tired. He felt being hungry. He felt... Uh, being pressured by the multitudes. He, he felt what it was to be human, and he sympathizes with our weakness, so he's a good high priest. He, is a, he can speak for us to the Father. <clears throat> but he says that we were, he was tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. Let us then, therefore, approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. So I want you to see that um, it's a throne of grace. God's grace is God's help, God's power to do what he's called us to do. But it says we can reproach with confidence and receive mercy, which is this forgiveness, his compassion and his forgiveness that's available. So it, I want you to realize that we have the ability today to enter into the place that only the high priest could enter into once a year to pray for the sins of the people to be forgiven and he would sprinkle the blood of the lamb over there. Now we have the ability to do what the high priest did. We can enter into the holy of holies of God in prayer, our spirit man right before God through the blood of Jesus. 
And it says, though, he was afraid, and he should have been afraid, because if anything, he had to have a sacrifice for his own sins before he went into that. And he could only go there once a year. Anytime else it would be unauthorized, he would be dead immediately. So you don't, he was stepping into the presence of God's glory. There was a fire by night and a cloud by day over that Holy of Holies, and uh, nobody could go in there except the high priest once a year. But yet, now we can, at any time, be in that position of being in, it says we can come to the throne room of grace. And it's a place of God's favor, God's help, and he shows us mercy, which is forgiveness, and grace, which is God's help to, to accomplish God's what God wants. So the, the prayer that will always be answered is the prayer that Jesus is praying, the prayer that God once prayed. We can have confidence. Going back to the first scripture, 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, we know, we know, we know that we have those things that we desired from him. This is the confidence. This is, I want you to have confidence today. Your conscience not bothering you. So that's one of the reasons we, we start, we approach God with a repentant heart and a humble heart, saying, Lord, if there's any area that needs to be straightened out. We want to get it straightened out so that we don't have a conflict in our soul. So we are body and we are soul and we are spirit. Our spirit is per perfectly united with God, but our soul is working on being united with our spirit and our body does what it wants unless we tell it what to do. So we got the inner conflict and the outer conflict constantly. So we're having to, we're trying to reach unity with our spirit and our spirit being unified with God. And when you're in that unity, there's the confidence that comes with it. We know that when our mind and our heart and our soul and, and everything's in total agreement with God, that, that we have a confidence and that our heart's not condemning us because our heart's not working against us. So that's why our, our soul needs to be transformed by the renewing of our mind with the truth, the Word of God. Because uh, 1 John 3, or 3 John 2, I mean, says that he... Uh, desires that we would prosper and be in health even as our soul has prospered. So we're able to receive all the good things from God because our soul is being transformed, being blessed and prospering and getting in line and unity with the, with the heart of God and the mind of God and the truth of God. So that all said, I want to talk to you a little, about, a little bit about Elijah because we... Callie's always saying that, you know, there's the spirit of Jezebel and God's raising up women to oppose that spirit because Jezebel was a feminine uh, spirit that was, a, was being used. So we go back to the story of Ahab. There was many kings in Israel, and before Ahab, some of them did good, some of them did bad. Ahab was not, was on the list of, high list of people that did terrible. <laughs> so... He married Jezebel, and Jezebel made sure and brought in Baal worship. Now, this was the king. This was not some foreign land. Ahab was the king of Israel, right? So he brought in, uh, she brought in worship of Baal and, and, and set up Asher poles in the temple and defiled the temple and did things that was totally made God really upset. So God brought in uh, we, Elijah to tell them, that there's not going to be rain for as long as I say it. Uh, I'm, he says, I'm going to prophesy to you that no, no more rain for as long as I say so. So for around three and a half years, there was no rain. It was a drought. And God sent Elijah to go get, be taken care of by a widow woman. And God took care of his people. During this time, uh, Jezebel, who symbolizes manipulation and, and doing things by force, manipulation and conniving to get her way. As the princess, she would persuade Ahab to do what she wanted. So she was killing off some of the prophets of God, and they were having to run and hide because she wanted her prophets to be up in front, the prophets of Baal. So she was getting them killed off. And so Elijah, of course, was, had gone off the scene for a while, but he comes back on the scene and he, he challenges them, the people of Israel, uh, on the mountain. What mountain was that? Or 
He challenges the people of Israel. It's in 1 Kings 18, 17 and 18. And he says, uh, yeah, Mount Oreb. And he says, whoever's God, let's find out. Let's just have a showdown. And whoever answers by fire, let's, let's all agree that we're going to worship him. So God, Elijah comes on the scene after they had, had drought for a while and says, uh, pour water all over my sacrifice. You know, the water was precious, and he didn't pour it out, that water. And he let the, the prophets of Baal do what they could do. And I'm sure they had some kind of supernatural power normally, but that day they, they didn't. And God stopped them from having anything. And they just and then Elijah begins making fun of them. And then we know the story. Elijah calls down fire from God, and it burns up the sacrifice. What happens next is he has the people, the people agree okay, God, Jehovah God, he's God. And so Elijah says, take those prophets and go down there and get rid of them. So they actually killed the prophets, which made Jezebel very angry when she found out, by the way. So what is, uh, <laughs> but during this time, let me talk about the confidence that, that Elijah had. Because after that, Elijah ran from, from uh, Jezebel for a while, but eventually came back and prophesied her doom. And she's, she is thrown down out of the window into the street, run over by horses and eaten by dogs. She was, she was the general Jehu. Prophet, uh, Elijah eventually, after running from Jezebel, comes back and says, he prophesies uh, that uh, Ahab would be killed, his children would be killed, and the whole family gets wiped out. They get removed from the scene, and uh, her death was not pretty. So we see that there's these two opposing forces. There's the spirit of Baal working through Jezebel in her way that she does it, manipulation. And then there's the prophet Elijah constantly. They're in conflict with one another. And there's a showdown, and Elijah show, and God shows up. But I want you to see the, uh, the confidence. Elijah says to King Ahab, go eat and drink because there's a sound of abundance of rain or heavy rain coming. Okay, so... At this point, Elijah's saying that there's going to be a rain coming now. It's, it's time for that prophecy to end of the, uh, because now God's back on the scene, so we're going to get out of this famine. We're going to get out of this drought, and God's going to start showing up and get rain back to your crops, which is awesome. But he says he, he has confidence because he knows that God told him he could pray that, and it would happen. So he tells him, just go ahead and go eat and drink because... You need to get that done because rain's coming. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, and Elijah climbed to the top of the mountain Carmel and bent down to the ground. Yeah, it was Mount Carmel. And put his face between his knees and began to pray. And then he told a servant, go look towards the sea and see if you see anything. And he asked him to go look seven times. There was nothing there. So he just told, he had confidence. And that's what Hebrews says. Hebrews tells us, to imitate the, the people of the Old Testament who through faith and patience received the promises God had promised them. There's faith and patience going together. It require, requires both, but I want to talk about the fact that you need confidence with it. Confidence is not arrogance. Confidence is humility. Humility knows our, our lack and our, nets, our need of God, but we also know how great God is, and we also know that God can't lie and that his promises are true and that if we pray in agreement, and ask anything according to his will, we receive it. So we can have confidence in that. It's not confidence in our ability. It's, not, it's confidence in the blood of Jesus. It's confidence in the covenant. It's confidence in God's character and that he can't lie. So we can have confidence. Sometimes it appears as arrogance. When, when Elijah says, go ahead and go eat and drink and get, get all ready because you're going to need to get down soon and, and because rain's coming. And he goes and prays and he's looking and there's nothing happening yet. Kind of like Daniel, prayed 21 days, nothing happening. But the angel was on his way, got interrupted by the prince of Persia, ends up getting there, but God was hearing his prayer from the day one. So God's hearing your prayers, and we pray in confidence in what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. And we pray in the name of Jesus, not our name, but we as representing Jesus in the name of Jesus. We can represent him. We are representatives, ambassadors of Christ. So we have confidence, therefore. He tells them to go look. And then finally the servant comes back and says, there's a cloud about the size, about this big. 
And that's all that um, Elijah needed. He said, let's get, let's get down from here because rain's coming. So he said, uh, the seventh time, the cloud as small, as small as a man's hands rising from the sea. And he said, go and tell Ahab to hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain comes. The rain stops you. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. He had confidence because all he saw was a little tiny wisp of smoke looking cloud there out in the distance. And, but yet he had confidence God was moving. And he had confidence to pray, tell Ahab to, that it was coming, but then he had confidence to say, it's here, you better start running. And so he got his chariots and then Elijah supernaturally beats him down the hill running. But I want you to see that and, and understand in this story that there's the spirit of Jezebel, Baal working through Jezebel. Baal was a worship of like nature God, fertility God. And uh, she was just representative of that and she promoted those because she was a person in power. Uh, she also wanted to take the land from one of the men that she wanted the property and he wouldn't give it. So she manipulated to say that he was uh, accusing, uh, he was coming against the king uh, and he was coming against God and blaspheming and he, she had him stoned to death by her own people. So uh, by his own people. So I want you to see that some, that correlation there that the church is being uh, under attack, wanting to be taken out of the picture, wanting to be muted, wanting to be not meeting together, wanting to take away their rights. So he had, he had a right to that land. She couldn't take, even though she was queen, she couldn't take his land because God had set in that you inherit your land from your next generation and that the boundaries can't be moved and people can't take your inheritance. So she had to finagle another way around it and use false claims against him, false witnesses, to claim that he actually was sinning against God and, and that he was stoned. So, uh, like I said, her end was not pretty. Being thrown out the window by Jehu, which is one of the generals, and being trampled under by the horses and being eaten by dogs. I just want to tell you that. It's very graphic, but, I, but she deserved it for what she did to the prophets of Israel is what I'm getting at. God repaid her. <clears throat> so... She was working that spirit, working through her. So as, as I believe that this group and this prayer is the spirit of Elijah, just like Jesus said that John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah and one of his major, his major sermon was repent for the kingdom of God is here. And so he was preparing the way through uh, repentance. I believe that the, one of the main things that we're doing as, and y'all are doing is preparing the way for the Lord. He's got a bigger plan he wants to do in America and the world. We're just, sometimes we focus on the one little area, but he's, he's thinking of a bigger plan. And so he wants to move upon all the earth and he wants to move upon America. He wants his glory to be seen. He wants people to come in into the last harvest. But we have to prepare the way in our prayers. We are cultivating, we're, we're breaking up the hard ground. We're planting seeds for a harvest. So, we want to pray in confidence this morning. We want to understand that we are coming like in the spirit of Elijah, which definitely composes the spirit of Baal, which Jezebel was under that influence. So we're coming against the spirit of Jezebel, influenced by Baal, who wants to control the church, who wants to shut down the church, and who wants to control everything through manipulation and witchcraft. So we've got to realize our enemy, but we realize our, our strength. And it's confidence that looks sometimes like uh, we're pride, but pride, it's not pride when you recognize I'm confident in the Lord. I'm confident that my prayers are being heard by the Lord because I'm praying in agreement with what God wants. So that's what I want you to understand this morning. When you go to prayer, take care of any issues in your heart. Take care of any sins, known sins. Get that out of the way so your conscience doesn't bother you. Confess it. God forgives. God washes it clean and he never remembers it and brings it up again. So if you're hearing your sins being brought up again, it's not God, it's Satan. So he's the accuser of the brethren. So you just declare, I'm forgiven. I've confessed it, I'm forgiven, it's forgotten, and God never brings it up again. So when we go in prayer, so let's pray. Time's about up, but I want you to be able to have time to go to church. Let's pray and let's just uh, do your normal prayers that you would normally do. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I want to pray with you. So Father, we, 
We thank you for, we are sounding an alarm. We are declaring your word that the spirit of the Lord is here. The kingdom of God has come, that you are moving in people's lives and churches. And in spite of, the, of uh, what seems to be the darkness rising up, you're raising up a standard against the darkness. And it's the name of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus. It's the power of the covenant and declaring your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. Your will be done in my heart first, the kingdom of my heart. Your will be done in the kingdom of my home, my church, the kingdom of my city. Your will be done, your kingdom come, and your kingdom manifest in the kingdom of this nation, United States of America. Watch over and protect our president and all those who you've called to usher in your move of God. All the leaders that you've hidden in caves, bring them out, protect them just like during Elijah's time, um, Jeze the spirit of Jezebel was trying to put to death the prophets. There were people that hid and protected them during that time. And it wasn't just Elijah, there were many. And so we thank you, Father, that you protect and hide your prophets and you give them a voice when, you're, when it's time and we can speak and pray in confidence that your will is going to be done. So we just declare over America, this is God's country. It was, it was founded on godly principles men that wanted independent independence from uh, their rulers to be able to worship freely. And Lord, we thank you that this nation was founded on you. So we declare this is still God's nation. And we declare that your kingdom manifest and that your kingdom rule, rule and reign and all those who oppose it would be cast down, Lord. All those spirits working behind the people, Lord, that the, the, you would go to the root of them and just remove them. And we pray, Lord, today that you would instill a confidence in your people that are praying today, that they would understand and know the truth, and that they would believe that they are accepted in love, that they are praying from a position of acceptance and love, that the blood of Jesus is continually washing over them, that they can boldly approach the throne room of grace and find help in the time of need. Lord, we thank you that we have a confidence in you. It's a confidence in you, not in ourselves. In our abilities but a confidence in our ability to line up and unify with you and be one with you and that gives us great confidence we pray for the authority and the power that you've given us to, to manifest in our prayers and in our lives lord you've given us not only uh, authority because of the blood of jesus but you've given us power through the holy spirit let that power manifest and answered prayers and changed hearts. We pray for the Holy Spirit to go and work and do what he does best, which is turn hearts towards you, speak to them, draw them, convict and convince of righteousness, right and wrong, and of the revelation of Jesus Christ and who he is, that they have a heavenly father that loves them and wants the relationship with them, and that sin is a problem, but he's dealt with that problem. He's made an open door so that we can come directly to him through the blood of Jesus and our sin is dealt with, and we thank you for that. We thank you that there's no more accusing voice from heaven so we don't listen to the accuser. We, we cancel out his voice in Jesus' name and we declare this is the Lord's God. My life is the Lord's. My family is the Lord's. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord and that this nation is God's and his will be done and his kingdom come in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you again soon. Go with the, in the name of the Lord. Shalom.